questions about what we covered so far? No? Alright, so my memory serves me correctly. This is where we left off. Alright, so you guys um, <clears throat> understand that membranes have to be a certain fluidity. If they're too uh, solid, then the, the channels that allow things to pass through them won't have the right shape. And remember, bio and biology shape is everything. So, <clears throat> the proteins themselves that allow, that form these channels that allow things to come through are called integral membrane proteins. Alright, so if you want to have access to a room, you need a door that goes all the way through. And so that's what these are. So, integral membrane proteins are ones that go all the way across the membrane. Usually those are involved in transporting something either into the cell or outside of the cell. And then there are also peripheral proteins. And you guys know what periphery is, right? So if you use your peripheral vision, what's that? Side, right? So they're either on the inside or the outside. Does that make sense? And then we talked a little bit about certain proteins can have, so here's a lipid, a phospholipid that has a these hexagons attached to that, what do you think those hexagons represent? So it's glucose, right? Chains of glucose. So, so we call that, collectively we call those glyco, right, for sugars. So that's a glycolipid because it's a lipid attached to sugars. So what would, uh, a protein attached to a sugar be called. Here's an example. A glycoprotein, right? So the you can see that the outside of the cell and the inside of the cell are different from one another and these provide signals for certain cells to to do certain things. Any questions about that? What's this molecule right here? What's it for? Yeah, so things that are colder have more cholesterol because they have to have their membrane more fluid. So here's a question. My uh, mother's cardiologist told her that uh, she shouldn't eat potatoes because that will increase her cholesterol level. Is that true? Why not? do to make their membranes more fluid? Do they use cholesterol? Only animals do. So are this, is there cholesterol in potatoes? No. <laughs> so I don't know where this guy went to medical school, but I'm starting to question that he actually has a real medical degree. Well, that could be it, but not the potato itself. Yeah, I don't know. Yeah, I'm just I'm the kind of doctor that's the Ross on Friends doctor. <laughs> All right, so uh, these integral membrane proteins that go across the membrane have different functions. One of those is transport, right? You want to move things in and out of the cell. You need a channel because they can't go through the membrane. Uh, well, only certain things can go through the membrane without a channel. Uh, enzymatic activity, so you can have reactions that are involved in these. Uh, signal transduction, so a good example of that would be insulin, so insulin doesn't have a channel, it's more of a receptor. So we have an insulin receptor, insulin is released by the cells, binds into that receptor, causes it to change its shape, and that elucidates a signal to produce another channel. What do you think that new channel is for? What does insulin do? signal transduction. Intercellular joining. So I use this example in my other classes. It's something that I'm interested in anyway. So if you look at um, a blood vessel, those are lined by cells of smooth muscle.
membrane proteins allow for flexibility into those cells where they join together, right? So in this case, your body would release a vasodilator, which would relax that and allow things to go through the, in between the cells that line your blood vessels. Does that make sense? And then this also has to do with why LDL and HDL are different. Do you guys know the difference between LDL and HDL? What's LDL? So is this the good or the bad cholesterol? The bad, right? And this is the good. Well, the reason this is bad is because it's small and it can fit in these junctions. HDL. And it's, it's this that the macrophage eat, and then they start building up plaques, which can close off the vessels. And then they're also involved in cell-to-cell -cell recognition. So, you know, you guys probably know that your brain cell and your lung cell and your heart cell, they all hang out together. It's not like the heart cell says, you know, I'm, I'm bored with you guys in the heart, let's go check out the, what the brain's doing, because that would be bad, right? Because it would interfere with the brain's function. So, those signals on the outside, those glycoproteins and all those other uh, receptors, signal each of the cells to hang out with other cells that are like them. Right? And what happens in cancer? Do the cells hang out with the cells are supposed to? No, they move. So they lose that cell-to-cell -cell recognition, and cancer can move to other cells. So we call that metastasis. And then the last one is attachment to cytoskeletal components in the extracellular matrix. You guys remember that from the last chapter? So the membrane itself is selectively permeable. That means that certain things can go in and other things can't. Um, so there's some rules about what requires a channel. So almost all molecules require a channel, but certain ones don't. Uh, the rule is that, so we have this hydrophilic head layer, right? And then we have these long tails. This is the bilayer. And this is the hydrophobic region. So, do you think water could pass through that? Why not? Because it wouldn't it wouldn't be able to mix with the fat, right? So the fatty acid tail. So, water can't pass through this because it's hydrophilic. Other molecules that are hydrophilic can't pass through it either. Um, What about, so the rule is there small molecules can go through there. We're talking about small, we're talking smaller than cholesterol. Remember cholesterol is like four rings. So cholesterol can pass through the membrane. It can't be hydrophilic, so what's the opposite of that? Hydrophobic, so hydrophobic things can pass through there. And then the last thing is what What's the requirement for water to be able to surround something to be hydrophilic? How does water dissolve salt? That's right, it's the charge, right? So, sodium has a charge, chlorine has a charge, so that makes things water-loving, right? Is DNA water-loving or water-fearing? Why? Because it has a negative charge and water can surround it. So, things that are charged can't pass through the membrane either. So, the rule again is small, smaller than cholesterol, uncharged and hydrophobic.
homophobic. So let's have a little quiz. See what you guys remember from chapter two. Can that pass through the membrane without a channel? Example of some test questions. Just letting you know. No, so cholesterol has got four rings of carbon, so that's got like 16 carbons in it.
because that's all they transport. So if there's a channel that transports glucose, you can bet that that's the only thing that it's probably going to transport. I mean, there are some exceptions, but generally they're very specific for what they allow to go in and out. <clears throat> Any questions about those? All right. So we covered this in the lab. I know half of you guys aren't in my lab, but I assume you guys did the the osmosis lab. So I'm just gonna I'm gonna rehash a little bit about this, but um, half of you guys have already heard this spiel probably. So diffusion is an important biological factor. That's the reason we're mostly water is because we need to be able to spread our molecules out inside the cell, and diffusion allows that to happen. So remember that. We learned this in chapter three that kinetic, so, so temperature is a, by definition is what? The average kinetic energy in a system, right? That means that anything with any temperature above absolute zero, the kinetic energy has the molecules moving. And if they move, then they spread out on their own. You guys know that things go from a concentration of high concentration to low concentration. If you had something rotting in your trash, you could find where that is, right? What do you do? You just keep going until it gets stronger because the the source is going to be a high concentration of stink, right? And then further, the further away you get from it, it goes to low concentration. Same thing with dyes in a liquid. So if you went home and took a drop of food coloring and put it in a glass of water, what would it do? Would it just hang out there? It would spread out. Do you have to put any energy into that? No, it does it on its own. You could stick it on the shelf and walk away because the molecules in there are moving around, right? Why are they moving? Because of temperature, right? Because the, if there's a temperature, by definition, there's kinetic energy in there. It's, it's already present. Does that make sense? Now, if you cooled your glass down to absolute zero, it wouldn't work anymore, but that doesn't really exist. So everybody get the fusion? Concentration of high to low. No energy required. Now, molecules don't interact or affect either in any way, shape, or form. So if I put a blue and yellow food coloring in the glass and I went away, after a while, they would all mix equally and it would be green, right? And the artist kind of drew this and, and you could critique the, the artistic ability here as it, it's relevant to science. So if there's six yellow molecules on this side and everything's spread out evenly, in the end, how many should be on this side? And this, right, same thing here. So there's 12 of these purplish, dots. So if this is drawn correctly, in the end, when everything moved out, spread out evenly, how many would be on each side? Six. And that's that's right. Or I would have written them by now and said, you guys need to fix your drawing. <clears throat> so things spread out evenly. Okay. So that sets up a, a problem because these water holes, these aquaporins, are always present in the cell. The cell doesn't regulate these. But it does regulate other things. So can salt go into the cell? No, not without a channel. So if you take a cell and put it in salt water, then salt can't move across that, right? Even though it wants to be equal, just like we talked about. But water can. So osmosis is a term that's used in biological systems that describes the effect of water movement based on conditions of other molecules present. Does that make sense? All right. So and this is pretty important to living things. So I'm going to close all the channels except the aquaporin cell and let's just pretend that you just went out and you were on a uh, stranded on a life 
raft in the middle of the ocean. So, depending on what ocean you're in, it's around 4% salt. And the inside of your cell is 0.9% salt. So what's saltier? Seawater or the inside of your cell? So then what happens to the water in this cell? So it's going to go out. Because if you wanted to make this less salty, let's say you had a glass of 4% salt water and you wanted to make it less salty, what would you do? Add water. So that's what's going on here, right? You want to make these equal, so you add water to make this go down. That's simple diffusion, right? All the molecules and the dyes were all equal. And as you take away water from this, let's say you're, you're boiling water and it's evaporating off, what happens to the concentration of salt in the cell? It goes up, right? So these are trying to equalize each other. They may never make it, but by the rules of diffusion, they have to try. Does that make sense? So if you drink seawater, what happens to you? Why do you get dehydrated? The water from what cells? So it's the cells that line your digestive system, right? Like your stomach. So let's, here's your stomach. It's lined with parietal cells. When you drink seawater, the same effect, right? So the water's going to go out through your digestive system and then you're going to get dehydrated. What happens to the shape of the cell? It's going to shrink, right? And as it shrinks, it has less space to do functions. So eventually, what happens? You die. So I told my class, my lab, about the four football players that went fishing off the coast of Florida. This is a great example. So that, you know, these are NFL players, so their minimum salary is like $250,000 a year, even if they're bench warmers. They took a boat out. They took a $300 anchor and threw it out. You know, they were drinking and stuff. And then they got ready to leave, and the, and the owner of the boat tried to pull up the anchor, and it wouldn't come up. So instead of, like most people, would just untie the anchor and go, oh, yeah, I'm going to go buy another $300 anchor because I make, you know, lots of money. He said, no, I'm not going to leave that anchor. So he had two 500 horsepower Merc engines on it. He gunned it, and the anchor didn't come loose. Guess what? The boat flipped over. And so they ended up in the ocean for a couple of days, and they started drinking seawater. So all, they all died except for one person lived, was, was survived. And that person did not drink seawater. All the other ones did. Why didn't they survive? Well, the, the guy that survived said that the last other person to survive was on the boat with him, and he was drinking seawater, and the last thing he did was take off his life jacket and then try to swim 80 miles to shore. So does that seem like an act of a sane person? No, probably because they didn't have any water to run their neural function, so they went insane and they ended up dying. Why do what? So, think about it. Well, we'll get to that in a second. Alright? We'll, we'll talk about that. This is for humans, right? This can vary depending on what organism. So, what if you're a plant and your salt concentration is 4% in the ocean, then what happens? So, did that answer your question? Okay. So, let's go back to humans again. <laughs> this condition, by the way, is called hyper tonic. Hyper means what? If you have a hyperactive child, what is what are they? Yeah, highly tonic. The real term means uh, pressure, right? But let's just say it's salt. So this means high 
salt, right? And so that's referring to what's outside of the cell because generally the inside of the cell is the same. Does that make sense? All right, so let's take another scenario. Let's say it's not seawater anymore, but let's say that uh, you were in a hospital and you made someone up an IV because they were de dehydrated and you just used distilled water that you bought from Safeway. So what happens then? So now this condition is called hypotonic. Hypo, yeah, like a hypoglycemic means low blood sugar, so that means low salt. So then what happens to the water now? The water's going to go rush in, right, to try to make this go down and this go up. So in this case, uh, what happens? The cells would burst and then they can't maintain homeostasis and then you would die. So there's a good example of this. There was a contest. I told my lab people this. There was a, a contest a few years ago when the Nintendo Wii came out. You know, and it was hard to get. And there was a radio contest. It was hold your Wii for a Wii, right? And so people would drink water, but they didn't go to the bathroom. So what happens to the the concentration of salt in your blood then? What do you think? You're drinking pure water, not going to the bathroom. It goes down, right? So then what happens to your cells? Water goes in, and... The woman won the Wii, right? But guess what? $300 game console, she died over it. And it's because her cells in her brain exploded. Without your brain cells, you can't function. So this is really important that you maintain it at the same concentration in your blood as inside of the cell. So what do you think your blood concentration of salt is? What do you think the concentration of an IV bag is at a, at a reputable hospital? 0.9%, right? Because you want to maintain the same salt environment. What is same, by the way? Yeah. Remember isomer? So isotonic means it has the same concentration on the outside as the inside. All right, so let's think about this. Let's go back to your plant question, right? You guys know that if you took a freshwater fish and you dumped it in salt water, what would happen? Why? Right, it's a different percentage of salt, but I want to know specifically why it would die. If I ask you on, a, on the test, Right, the water flows out of its cell because what kind of solution is it in? Hypertonic, right? And that causes water to flow out of the freshwater fish's cells and then it dies, right? That's why. What if you took a saltwater fish and threw it in a freshwater aquarium? It, that's right, it would die too. And why would it die? Because and now it's in a hypotonic solution and the water flows inside its cells and causes those to burst. Same effect, right? They're both dead, but different mechanisms. So the inside of the saltwater fish cells is a higher salt concentration to match that of seawater, right? The inside of the freshwater fish's cell has a different concentration to match what it lives in, just like you guys. Does that make sense? I'm not sure. Yeah, I have to look it up. That's 
why salt can't go across this membrane, right? It's got a charge. But water can't because it has the aquaporins. So this is a dynamic system, right? It's not like the cell just goes, okay, that's enough water. Right? It's, things are flowing in and out, right? So, you know, water's going to go in and out until it equalizes. So water's going to, some molecules of water are going to go out and some will come back in until that they randomly mix completely. <clears throat> so here's some terms for osmosis. Osmotic concentration is the solute concentration of the solution. So like, this would be the osmotic concentration, 0.9%. Or you could also make this in, what's another way that we write concentration? From chapter 3? No? Well, I mean, that is, but when, when you're writing the concentration of a solution, moles, mol, molar, right? Capital M. <clears throat> and then osmotic pressure. So if you got water going in here, what happens to the pressure inside of this? It's the same thing that ha So if you squeeze a balloon and there's air going into it, what happens to your hand? It's going to push out, right? Why? Because there's pressure inside that balloon that's pushing on your hand. So as we increase the amount of water inside a membrane, the pressure also increases. That's why eventually it's going to burst, right? It's not bursting for any other reason except that the pressure is higher than the cells can maintain and then they explode and then reverse osmosis you guys have probably we live in Arizona so you've probably gone to some magic machine in front of a you know convenience store that got water or bought it how's that work That's a filter, but it's not reverse osmosis. What does osmosis mean? Right? Okay, so if we're doing reverse osmosis, that means that we need a membrane. And we need, what, a difference in salt concentration, right? So here's a rendering of a cell, and here's a rendering of what your, this, the machine in front of your store looks like. So there's a piston, and on the sides is, you know, city water, and this membrane only allows water to flow through, and it's generally made out of cellulose or something like that. So, what do we need in here to get the water to go in? So, so all water and ices have to have their water tested by, by federal regulations in the state of Arizona. So I used to work at aquatic consulting and testing. They would test that water. And so I know how disgusting it is. <laughs> so everybody, any questions about osmosis? So animal cells are a little different than plant cells. So remember, animal cells want to be the same shape. They don't want to blow up or shrink, like the example that I said. So they want to be in what kind of solution?
just rem- that just reminded me like of American Werewolf in London. I hope there's not some sort of monster coming down the hall. Uh, Disotonic, right? Because if they're in hypertonic, what happens to the cells? Hyper shrink, hypo burst. Plants are different because they have cell walls, remember? So uh, the way that plants work is the cell walls made out of cellulose, if you guys know that. And then they have a cell membrane just inside the cell wall that's attached at various points. You can kind of think of it as, well, the way that I think of it is, it's sort of like a balloon, a blown up balloon that's inside a box, like a solid box like super glued it at specific points. So then what would happen if you pulled all the air out of that balloon? It would stretch those points that it's glued to the box, right? And that runs a risk of them tearing. So if your balloon tears, if your cell membrane tears, right, then can you maintain homeostasis? And then the plant dies. So So that's called what we call uh, plasmolysis, or plasmolysis. Is that why when you overwater plants, would it basically dehydrate it? No. That's totally Yeah, so if you overwater a plant, what you're doing is you're restricting the ability for them to do gas exchange in their roots, and so they'll die. But it has nothing to do with osmosis. Plants want to be in 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 a high water environment because the balloon pushing all all the balloons pushing on each other makes it stronger than if they weren't pushing on each other. It's just a thing of physics. So uh, plants want to be in a hypotonic solution because it gives them more strength as opposed to isotonic. So if you stop watering your plants, what do they do? They wilt, and the reason they wilt is because that pressure, that osmotic pressure, isn't present to allow them to stay up straight. And then if you put salt water on a plant, you guys did this in lab with the onion, what happened? Right? It shrank, and some of them probably tore, so if you put fresh water back on them, they wouldn't go back to the same shape, because they can't. <coughs> So that's osmosis. So, you know, on the test, I might, you know, you know, give you examples like we talked about. Like, you take a freshwater fish and throw it into salt water. What happens, and why? Uh, what's the magic of reverse osmosis? What's osmotic pressure? What do animal cells like to be in? Hyper, hypo, or iso? What about plants? What do they like to be in? Hypo. Uh, why can't you pour salt water on a plant? It'll dehydrate, and what's the risk? Plasmolysis, right? The plasma membrane will rip. And you can't reverse that. Okay, so back to diffusion. And so back to our cell, so we have a channel, and so if I have a high concentration of something out here that can go inside through the channel, let's say the channel is functional, and there's just a few of those molecules in here, by diffusion, which way are they going to go? In or out? High concentration to low concentration. What if there's a bunch of them in here and only a few out here? Which way would it go? Out. So that's diffusion, right? I mean, it's simple diffusion, high to low. But this is called facilitated because there's a channel present that allows that to happen. If the channel wasn't there, could it happen? No. So the channel facilitates the ability of those molecules to, to operate under diffusion. Oxygen. oxygen doesn't need a channel. Neither does oxygen. 
because it is carbon dioxide. Okay, so there's another form of diffusion called the gated facilitated diffusion. So in this case, you have a, a integral membrane protein that has a specific shape. So in this case, the artist has drawn it as being this open gate, right? The molecules are higher on the outside than the inside. So what direction would you expect these to go? From the out to the in, right? So if I put this on the test and didn't put the arrows on it, you could tell me which direction these are going. Right? All right. So high to low, it goes in here. When you add one molecule to another molecule, what does it do to it? Changes its shape, right? So this molecule, in fact, is binding to the protein, changing the protein shape. So now it does this. And then when it changes its shape, the molecule gets released. And then what happens? It goes back to its original shape. So this thing is like a gate, right? And remember, these are specific, so it's only going to transport one kind of molecule. Could be glucose or something like that. Or sucrose or lactose or galactose or iron or salt or anything. But it's going to be specific for what it transports. Does this require energy? No, because it's diffusion, right? So what does the cell do if it wants to go against the concentration gradient? Think about it this way. So you guys know that if I stood on a mountain and I poured water on the top of that mountain, where would the water go? Down, right? Do I have to put any energy in that? But how did I get the water to the top of the mountain? I had to use energy to get it up there, right? I could carry it or I could pump it. I could hand crank pump it, right? That still requires energy. I could stick it in an electric pump and pump it. But regardless, I have to put energy in the system to go against that natural flow. And it's the no different in diffusion. So if you want to go against diffusion, you can do it, just like you can get water to run uphill, but you got to put energy into it. So when we put energy into transport, we call that active. That's different than passive, which is what we've been talking about, because that's just the fusion. Does that make sense? So what's our energy source? ATP. So usually it's an, it requires ATP. It's called pumping because that's basically what you're doing. And one of the major roles of this is it helps maintain ionic gradients, differences in concentration of ions across membranes. Why would that be important, you think? What happens if you get a cramp? Okay. Your, your muscles aren't functioning. So what do they tell you to do for a cramp? Right, and why, do you, why do, would you want potassium? What's potassium? It's an ion, right? So you need ions in order to make your muscles function properly. So one of the most important things for that is sodium potassium pump. I mean, you guys probably seen these infomercials, right? You could buy this ab workout thing and you just stick it on your stomach and you can eat chips and watch TV and get a good workout, right? How does that work? It doesn't work, by the way. But what does it do? What's the premise behind it? Nobody seen this? It's like a electrodes they put you put on your abs and it shocks you, causes your muscles to contract. So you guys know that electricity will cause your muscles to contract. All right. So in fact, your muscles contract based on electrical gradients. So what's electricity? 
transfer of electrons, and to do that, you need differences in charges. Everybody agreed with that? So we've already kind of covered this. So the sodium potassium pump produces this difference in charges, and it's pretty simple. So the artist drew it with these little, you know, circles that fit nicely, these circle sodiums that they've drawn, right? This isn't really what sodium looks like, and you guys know that, but. So these sodiums fit in here. There's three of them because they have the same shape, right? And that most important thing in biology is shape. So now we have these bound, but we want to change the shape of this integral membrane protein. So we add a phosphate to it. When you add a molecule to another molecule, what does it generally do? Change its shape. So now the artist has drawn that the protein has changed its shape. So now it's these this circle doesn't fit in here anymore, right? So they're forced out. Notice that this shape is a, a, a really a high angled, well, I guess a low angled triangle if you measure this angle. So it's really steep. And then once the phosphate's added, it changes its shape so it's more like a pyramid, so the angle's bigger. Now it will fit the triangular drawn potassiums that the artist drew. This wouldn't fit in, in here, right? So two potassiums bind on the integral membrane protein. Then you want it to go back to its original shape. What do you do? Take off the phosphate, and then it goes back to the nice smooth circles and then the really small angled triangle, forcing the potassiums into the cell. So that's how ATP allows this thing to move by changing its shape. Remember we talked about the when when myosin, the motor protein, you add a phosphate to it, it changes its shape so it can walk. So it's the same thing here except you're using it as a pump. So ultimately we've pumped out three sodiums. What's the charge on sodium? Plus one. So our net is we put plus three on the outside of the cell, right? And then we pumped in two sodiums. So our net on the inside of the cell is, what's the charge on sodium? I'm sorry, potassium. Plus one. So two potassiums in our Plus two, everyone agree? So what's the net charge here if we reduce this? This one becomes negative and this one becomes positive, right? And so now you have the same thing as in a battery. You can use that to flow electrons. So that's how you power your muscles. And this is why you're they want you to eat a banana so you can run your sodium potassium pump. Any questions? Okay, so you know that simple molecules can go across the membrane. What's the rule? Small, uncharged, hydrophobic. So, can it, so test question, can oxygen go across the membrane without a channel? Yes. What about water? Why not? It has slight charges, but more importantly, it's water likes itself. So it's not hydrophobic. Water is not afraid of itself. Then we have facilitated diffusion, right? So molecules can go through a channel, does that require energy? Where does it always go? High concentration to low. So if I drew this without an arrow, you would tell me what direction these molecules are going, right? Because it's obvious there's more out here than in here. Everybody got it? All right. And then there's a, two kinds of facilitated diffusion. There's gated and non-gated. Does the gated require energy? No. It's still diffusion. And then if you want it to go against the gradient, 
So in this case, it's showing low to high, which would be against the gradient, right? If this arrow wasn't here and I told you that this was passive, what direction would you expect these molecules to go? Out, right? So this is active transport. And if we have active transport, we need energy. What's the energy come from? ATP. And specifically, it's the phosphate, right? It's that phosphate that gets transferred. So that's pretty straightforward. Any questions about that? So what you're doing is you're generating what we call a membrane potential. Why is it called potential? What kind of energy is in a battery? Potential energy, right? If it was a different kind of energy, they might call it a membrane kinetic, but it's not. It's a membrane potential. That means the membrane has potential energy that it can store and release whenever it wants, right? You could hook up your battery anytime you want, but if you're if it's sitting in your drawer, it's generally not using any energy, right? It's stored energy. So the energy across the membrane is what we call membrane potential because it's electrical energy, like in a battery. Um, Usually the interior of the cell is negatively charged and the exterior is positively charged, like the sodium potassium pump. Um, and these voltages can range, usually they're about 200 millivolts. Um, so just to give you an idea, that's about a fifth of a volt. Do you guys know what D batteries, what voltage D batteries are? Everybody knows what a D battery looks like? Big battery. What's the voltage on it? Any idea? So they're they're next time you're in the store or whatever you're at home, look at it. It's 1.5 volts. So how many cells does it take to generate the energy of a D battery? Like seven and a half, right? So how many cells do you have in your body? over a trillion. So you think you're generating a massive amount of energy? Yeah, you are, right? You're generating the energy of, you know, enough D batteries to fill this entire room. Every cell has that potential, right? Or can generate that. So it's a massive amount of electricity that you generate and use every day to make all the ATP that you need to do all the things you're doing, like writing and thinking, hopefully, and, you know, walking around, and stuff like that. We also call that the electrochemical gradient because we're using chemicals across a membrane, right? That's a gradient to generate what? Electricity. So electrochemical gradient. The chemicals, right, sodium and potassium are chemicals, they have a gradient higher on the outside than the inside, and that generates electrical potential. So that's what we call the electrochemical gradient. It works the same as a battery, right, exactly the same. And you can use it to do work, just like you use, I mean, what do we use electricity for? Like pretty much everything? Your body's the same way. It uses electricity to, for almost everything that you do. But it uses that electricity to generate ATP. And we'll cover how that happens in Chapter 9. But it's important for you to understand this concept in order to understand how you generate ATP using electricity. Your body does this. It's doing it right now. The moving of these electrons requires you to breathe air because what's the what's the most electronegative element besides fluorine? So you breathing air is allowing the electrons to go on to oxygen. It allows them to flow in a certain direction. Without oxygen, your electrons wouldn't flow. How long can you live without generating electricity? Hold your breath. Not long. So you use a massive amount of electricity. All right, so the sodium potassium pump isn't the only way that you can generate these electrochemical gradients. The 
the way that the mitochondria do it and the way that bacteria do it is they use protons instead. So remember what a proton is? It's a hydrogen without an electron. So generally they're written as H plus. So in this case, instead of sodium potassium, they pump, usually pump H pluses across the membrane. So again, we get the positive charge on the outside, negative charge on the inside, and it's still the same effect as the sodium potassium pump, right? Except we're using hydrogen instead of sodium and potassium. And we call it a proton pump because we're using protons. If we were using sodium and potassium, we would call it the sodium potassium pump. This is another reason that scientists think that mitochondria may have evolved from bacteria because bacteria use this same system that mitochondria use to generate energy. And we'll cover the specifics of how all this works when we get to chapter 9. All right? But you guys need to know that you have to have a basic understanding of how, what's going on here before we get into the details of it. So make sure you understand how this works. Any questions? No screen? Fixed. If you guys have no screen, I can't fix that. It's blinking. It must have been my complaint calls. That and me getting locked out of the room. You call the emergency number? Do you have an emergency? No, I just need to get into my classroom. Would you like the emergency number? No, I just wanted you to open the door. <laughs> or the non-emergency number? No, I just want you to open the door. I can't believe my key card opens every door in this whole building except this one room. All right, so <clears throat> there's another way that you can transport things. It's called co-transport, right? So. Uh, it's kind of like if uh, you're riding on another kind of pump indirectly. So the way this works is, let's say you have a proton pump, right? You know that if you're going to use a pump, this is active transport, so it's against the gradient. So we need ATP. So we can pump hydrogens out, but you can have other molecules piggyback on the diffusion. Does that make sense? So in this case, sucrose can, can sort of hitch a ride on a proton as it comes back in. Because if you pump something out, right, the concentration is higher. If there's another channel that allows it to go back through, it's going to go back in by diffusion. And when it does, it can pull sucrose in with it against the gradient. So you're indirectly using energy to get sucrose to go in. So that's what we call a co-transporter because it's transporting two molecules at the same time. You're just, you don't have to actually have a shape change in the sucrose protein. You can use other things like protein, like you can use protons for lots of stuff, right? So you don't have to specifically have a mechanism to cause the ATP to change the shape of the sucrose or pump it. Okay. So, that's if the cell wants to move, you know, smaller molecules across. But, you know, sometimes you don't want to take a sip of water. You want to take a drink, right? You want to take a gulp. And so the cells do the same thing. So they can export or import massive amounts of molecules in a process we call exocytosis or endocytosis. And I showed you guys the video on this before when we were talking about how proteins get into your salivary glands and stuff like that. So you have uh, exocytosis, exo means out or exit. So that's when you transport things outside of the cell, like we talked about the proteins, the amylase in your saliva gets exported. Um, and then we also have endocytosis. So endo means, anyone know? 
pick in. So then this is subdivided into three categories. So phagocytosis means that phago means eat or food. So phagocytosis is pulling in like food or solids. And then pino means drink. So that's pulling in liquids. And then receptor mediated endocytosis is pulling in things based on them binding to a receptor on the surface of the cell. So there's different receptors for every kind of molecule you can think of. So there's lots, thousands upon thousands. stop blinking so I can turn your screen on now. Alright, so we'll go we'll go uh, over each one of these. So phagocytosis is a process where uh, cells can take in large solid particles. A good example of this is a white blood cell. So a white blood cell would you know identify a bacteria, cruise around until it got a hold of it, and then it would bring it inside the cell. And the way that it does that is it makes False feet, pseudopodia. What cytoskeletal component would produce that? That's from chapter six. Nobody studied chapter six this weekend? Come on. So, what cytoskeletal component produces pseudopodia? It's the same thing that make, does amoeboid movement. We talked about this in chapter six. What side of skull? Look, there's three. Microfilaments, microtubules, intermediate filaments. Which one is it? No. <laughs> What's the first one? <laughs> microfilaments, that is correct. So the cell would make microfilaments, to make these false feet, it would extend out, or surround the bacteria, and pull it in. That's phagocytosis. And then what does it do with the bacteria? Just say, hey, hang out in my house. Shoves it in the lysosome, right? The lysosome will degrade it into its monomers, and then the cell will recycle those into your polymers. So this is how it works. This is an elect what kind of electromicrograph is this? Scanning or transmitting? You would be correct. So then what is it? <laughs> transmitting. Yes, that's correct. It's a transmitting electron micrograph. Because you can see the inside of the cell, right? You want to study the inside. We call ultra structures or small structures of the cell. You need a transmitting electron microscope. All right. And we talked about pseudopodia before, but I'll just remind you, pseudo means what? False. What's a podiatrist study? Feet. So pseudopodia is false feet. And it's gen those are generated by what cytoskeletal component? Microfilaments. So you guys will need to know that for the test. That's that's old stuff. That's chapter six stuff. All right. So we'll pick up uh, pinocytosis on Thursday.
There is no class next Tuesday. For my class. There is class. Because I'm going out of town. in the syllabus. I said Tuesday, next Tuesday, I think it's the 22nd, is study day. So you guys study that day. Don't goof off. There's a lab on Thursday. There's a lecture on Thursday. There's no lecture on Tuesday, a week from today. Oh, you may be right. I have to check the schedule. But you may be right. There may not be a lab on Thursday. It may be the, and I think you are right, it may be the mitosis and meiosis lab. And if it is, that's a, that's an at-home lab. 